Uh, and welcome. I am Professor Veronique Munoz Dandé, and I am uh, the chair of the Jacobson Committee. And I'll just say very few words about today's event. So the Jacobson lecture, which we will have today, was established in the 1980s following a donation to the university from Mr. Jacobson. And along with the lecture, Mr. Jacobson also funded the creation of a research fellowship and an essay prize, which are all on the subject of philosophy. The Jacobson Trust funds are based at the Institute of Philosophy within the School of Advanced Study. And the funds are overseen by the Jacobson Committee, which is comprised of academics from philosophy departments across the University of London Colleges. I introduce our speaker, Professor Kasim Kassam, in a minute. But first, let me highlight something about the Jacobson Essay Prize. The Essay Prize is open to all research students of the University of London, and it is blind reviewed by academics from Birkbeck College, King's College London, the London School of Economics, University College London, and the Institute of Philosophy. Now, the joint winners of the 2021 Jacobson Essay Prize the joint winners on your screen are Tom Beavers from King's College London for his essay Vagueness and Conditionals and Jessica Fisher for her essay The Individualist Objection. And the committee wishes to publicly congratulate both winners on their submissions. Well done. Now, it's a particular pleasure for me to introduce Kasim Kassam, whom I was lucky enough to have as a colleague for some time at UCL. Kasim was born in Kenya, but came to the UK aged 13. He is currently professor in the Department of Philosophy at Warwick. He was previously Knightsbridge Professor of Philosophy at Cambridge and Professor of Philosophy, as I said, at UCL. He has also held visiting professorships at the University of California at Berkeley and at Northwestern University. But prior to all this, the greatest part of his career so far has been at Oxford, where he studied PP, then went on to be supervised by Peter Strossen for a thesis on transcendental arguments, he thought he would become a lawyer, I think, but instead got his first job at a very young age at Oriel College and was fellow and tutor at Wadham College from 1986 to 2004. Kasim is the author of six books on subjects ranging from self-knowledge and perception to, more recently, conspiracy theories and intellectual vices. By intellectual biases, he is focused in particular on attitudes towards truth, knowledge, and evidence, which get in the way of knowledge. His vice epistemology project encompasses attention to professional vices and virtues in modern medicine, the epistemology of counterterrorism, and resistance to change. His current research is on post-truth, extremism, the philosophy of terrorism, and the philosophy of general practice. Now, two more notes on our speaker. Having been his colleague, I can say that Kusim is passionately committed to teaching. And I can also add that he turns out to be an expert on Martinis and where to locate the good ones in London. Kasim is joining today a list of exceptional philosophers and intellectuals who have gifted London with their words and ideas in the Jacobson lecture series. Today, he'll talk to us on 
extremism, a philosophical analysis, a topic on which he is currently writing. In fact, he has finished a much awaited book, which will come out in September. Kusin. Okay, well, thanks, Veronique, for that very kind uh, introduction. Um, okay, so I'm going to take you back to uh, the start of 2020 uh, and a story in The Guardian, um, which was about uh, uh, an organization called Extinction Rebellion. Um, so what I'm going to do is to uh, share, this, share my screen with you so you can look at the, uh, you can look at the quote. Um, not quite matter um, okay so okay so there's the slide okay so the guardian said the counter-terrorism police have placed the non-violent group extinction rebellion on a list of extremist ideologies that should be reported to the authorities running the PREVENT program, that's a counter-terrorism program. Uh, XR, Rafiqa Terrorism, and a pro-terrorist Islamic Islamist group. Uh, so later that day, uh, Extin Extinction Rebellion uh, uh, put, a, put out a press release in response to this story, and the press release said, how dare they? In a world of misinformation, um, where lies are faster than the truth, we can't help uh, asking whether this was a deliberate attempt to side focused on the real extremists, the fossil fuel companies and those that do their bidding. So this is all sort of familiar enough stuff. Uh, what, you, what you see here is an illustration of something that um, you've all encountered, which is the use of the label extremist as essentially a term of abuse. Um, uh, it's used, it's applied to extin Extinction Rebellion, and then they apply it to the people applying it um, to them. Uh, I mean, this case is, is actually quite interesting because um, if you look on the XR website, one thing that they say is that they uh, are an international movement that uses non-violent civil disobedience um, in response to the climate emergency. Um, so on the face, it's, you might think there's something a little odd about classifying this as an, as an extremist group. There's questions about the relationship between extremism and violence, which I'll come back to uh, in a bit. Uh, but one thing you might suspect on the basis of all this is that, is that well, may, maybe this label extremist just isn't a very useful label. Maybe there isn't really such a thing as extremism. Maybe um, we should just recognize that this is essentially just a sort of pejorative label with no substantial intellectual content. Um, so I don't think that that's the right way to deal with this. It seems to me that although the label extremism or extremist is misused, that doesn't mean that it doesn't have a proper use. So, for example, democracy is a label that's misused. Um, but that doesn't mean that there isn't um, a, a, a genuine and recognizable phenomenon of democracy. Um, so what I want to do in this lecture is to sketch uh, some of the key features of what I take extremism to be, uh, and then uh, respond to this uh, worry that, that, that it, it isn't really a thing. I want to say it is a thing. Okay, so just to keep things organized, uh, here are the kind of three questions that I'm going to address uh, in this lecture. So the first one is obvious, what is extremism? What are we talking about when we talk about extremism or describe certain individuals or groups as extremists? Uh, second question, how useful is the concept of extremism? So that's the question that's raised by my initial slide. Um, I mean, it, it, does the concept help us to analyze or understand a real phenomenon, or is it simply a term of abuse? Uh, and not just a term of abuse, but a term of abuse that's used to delegitimize, to delegitimize radical opposition to the status quo. Um, so that's the second question. And the third question I'm going to ask is, is extremism necessarily a bad thing? I mean, obviously, the fact that it's used as an insult implies that it's it's not good to be an extremist, but is it actually necessarily um, uh, perspective on this uh, 
is uh, Philip Roth's novel American Pastoral, uh, in which one of the uh, one of the characters um, says um, memorably um, that sometimes you have to fucking go to the extreme. Uh, and that might, of course, be the view of some people about the about the climate emergency. Right? We are in dire straits, and extreme measures are called for. Um, there's also the famous uh, remark: uh, extremism in defence of liberty is no vice, and moderation in pursuit of justice is no virtue. That was uh, the right-wing American politician Barry Goldwater. Yeah, no, certainly no moderate. Uh, back in the 1960s, and Martin Luther King Jr. said similar things to this. Okay, so there, there, there are the three, what I take to be the three key issues. Okay, so let's start off with the first issue, what is extremism? So I'm going to suggest that we can distinguish, we should distinguish between um, three types of extremist, or if you prefer, three forms of extremism. Um, methods extremism, um, positional extremism, and psychological extremism. Um, so positional extremism, I'll also sometimes refer to as ideological extremism. Okay, so the first one, methods extremism. So methods extremists are individuals or groups, organizations that use or endorse the use of extreme methods in pursuit of their objectives. Okay, now this, of course, raises the question, what's an extreme method, which I'll come to in a minute, but this is, the basic idea that being an extremist is a matter of using or perhaps endorsing the use of extreme methods, however those are defined. Uh, the second form of extremism, positional or ideological extremism, uh, is, um, is, is defined as follows. A positional extremist uh, is someone who subscribes to an extremist ideology. Um, so here the, the focus is not on methods, the focus is on ideology. Uh, so their extremism, the extremism of an ideological extremist is defined by their position in what you might call ideological space. What are you talking about when you talk about ideological space? And I'll come back to that. Uh, and the third type of extremist is the psychological extremist. So psychological extremists have what I call an extremist mindset. That is to say, they, um, they display certain characteristics, preoccupation, characteristic preoccupations, and taken together constitute this extremist mindset. Now, uh, these different kinds of extremism uh, have all sorts of in interesting and complex relations with one another. Um, so, for example, you might think that um, um, certain extremist ideologies also promote the use of extreme methods, therefore ideological and methods extremism go together. You might think that having uh, an extremist mindset makes you more likely to be an ideological extremist. You might think that ideological extremist makes it more likely that you'll have an extremist mindset. So um, th th this is, this, these are just three pieces that I'm putting on the board, really. Um, and the task of this lecture is to elucidate these three pieces and say something about the relationship between them. All right, so let's start off with methods extremism. Um, so here's a kind of simple view, which I, which I think is, is implicit in a lot of um, public discourse about extremism. Um, so extreme methods are often understood simply as violent methods and as extreme in virtue of their reliance on the use of violence. Um, so extremists are basically people who use violence to achieve their political objectives on this view. Now that raises all sorts of complicated questions about the definition of violence, which is a, an extremely large and, and complex subject. But for the purposes of this lecture, I'm going to just adopt a kind of very narrow, uh, restrictive definition of violence. Uh, it's basically the exercise of physical force so as to it, it inflict injury on or damage to persons or property. Um, and if you if you if you had more time, you might want to think about what uh, one 
is to understand by physical force, but let, let me not get into that here. Okay, so two observations about this approach. Um, I mean, the first thing to say is that it's not obvious that extreme methods are necessarily violent. You might think there are some uh, methods that count as extreme intuitively, but which do not involve vice in the 1980s. So in, early, uh, in the early 1980s, IRA prisoners in, in jail in, in Northern Ireland were uh, campaigning to be recognized as political prisoners and not as ordinary criminals. <clears throat> uh, so one thing that they did in pursuit of that political objective was to go on hunger strike. Uh, most famously, Bobby Sands, an IRA uh, prisoner, uh, refused food for 66 days and died. Uh, another aspect of this uh, uh, campaign by the IRA was the so-called dirty protest, which had basically involved smearing fecal matter on the walls of their, of their cells. Um, now, these are both, uh, at least on some view, um, extreme methods of pursuing a political objective, but it's not clear that they're violent. Um, uh, starving yourself to death, I mean, is, does, is that, does that involve the use of violence? Well, not if you define violence as narrowly as I have defined it um, here. So that's one side, so that's one, one issue. Um, you shouldn't equate extreme methods with violence because there are intuitively extreme methods that are not violent. Looking at it the other way around, it's also not clear that the use of violence in pursuit of political objectives necessarily makes one an extremist in the methods sense. Um, so here's an example. Uh, so the ANC, the African National Congress, used violence in its campaign against apartheid. Um, they call their campaign an armed, um, an armed struggle. Uh, and um, you might want to say that, well, uh, you shouldn't call the ANC um, extremists um, on, on that account for a number of reasons. Number one, it was violence in pursuit of a just cause. It was violence against injustice. Uh, and number two, they had no choice. Now, now, if those things are true, and if those are arguments against classifying the ANC's violence as extremist violence, then it looks as though the whole issue of what um, counts as an extreme method is more complicated than it seemed uh, at the outset. Um, so here are, here are kind of two ways of thinking about this whole issue of um, what counts as an extreme method. Um, so on the one hand, there is what I call intrinsicalism. So this just says that the extent to which a person or organization counts as extremist in the method sense depends on the intrinsic qualities of their methods. So for example, depends on whether their methods are violent or not. On the other hand, contextualism says that the question whether the use of a particular method constitutes methods extremism uh, depends on a range of contextual factors. It can't be answered just by looking at intrinsic features of the method. Right? So for example, it might be true that the ANC um, used, uh, used violence in its campaign against apartheid, including, uh, including uh, for example, the planting of car bombs, but the fact that they planted uh, to answer the question, you need to look at a whole bunch of contextual factors. So what are these contextual factors um, that are relevant? Um, so here are four contextual factors uh, that, that, that seem to me anyway to be relevant to this question. So first of all, there's a question about the nature of the ends or objectives of violence. So I think there's a greater inclination to describe the use of violence as methods extremism when it's violence in pursuit of an unjust uh, objective, um, but not when it's violence in pursuit of a just objective. A second issue that uh, we can and should take into account 
is the issue of necessity. Was the violence necessary in the context in which it was being used? So it endorses the use of violence even when there are alternatives, genuine alternatives. So Nelson Mandela uh, wrote that uh, um, uh, violence by the ANC was the only method that would destroy apartheid. Um, so, so, so Mandela is relying very heavily on the necessity argument uh, there. Uh, and Franz Fanon says something very similar when he talks about uh, violence in relation to colonialism. So colonialism, according to Fanon, is violence in a natural state, and it will only yield when confronted with greater violence. Okay, so, so the thought there is that, is that anti-colonial liberation movements that resort to violence when they have no alternative should not, on those grounds alone, be classified as methods extremists. Um, there's also a question about the proportionality of violence. Um, another very important um, question, a very complicated question, was violence proportional or not? Um, and lastly, a question about the targets of violence. Um, so, so the thought here is that, is that um, um, to count as a methods extremist, um, you not only uh, need to use or endorse the use of violence to achieve political objectives, um, but to use violence in an indiscriminate way or not properly discriminate way. Right, so a good example of, 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 of methods extremism then in this sense was um, um, the violence of Al-Qaeda. So uh, here's, here's uh, Osama bin Laden. So bin Laden notoriously said in 1998 that it is, quote, the duty of every Muslim to kill the Americans and their allies, civilian and military. So he's quite explicit there uh, in, in including uh, in, in, in civilians as legitimate um, targets. Um, and at times he justifies this on the basis that American civilians are not innocent, and they're, they're somehow complicit in the crimes of the US. Uh, at other times, uh, Bin Laden accepted that the violence he is recommending or was recommending did indeed target innocents, uh, but he tried to argue that that was okay. So in a, in a notorious uh, interview that Bin Laden gave, he said, Yes, so we kill their innocents. This is valid, both religiously and logically. Um, so there you have a kind of classic statement of um, methods, uh, methods extremism. Okay, so there's a, there's, a, there's a lot more to say about all of this, uh, but I hope I've just given you um, a, a kind of rough idea of uh, the sorts of consideration that I think are relevant to classifying an individual or organization as extremist in the method sense. And I mean, the obvious moral of the story is it's complicated. All right, now moving on to um, um, positional or ideological extremism. Um, so I talked earlier on about um, location in ideological space. So an ideology counts as positionally extremist in virtue of its location in this space. Um, so supposing you think of ideological space as having dimensions, uh, so classically the left to right dimension, then on this view, the extremist position falls somewhere near the end or fringe um, of some salient political dimension. That's paraphrasing something that uh, Robert Nozick says in a very useful paper on the characteristic features of extremism. Uh, so, so one thing to note straight away is that ideological space is multi-dimensional. There's more than one dimension. Uh, there's also the authoritarianism spectrum, there's the pro-violence spectrum, and uh, many others. Uh, so ideologies that might, for example, be at opposite ends of the left to right spectrum, um, uh, so ultra-communism and fascism, you, you might think of as being at opposite ends of the left to right spectrum, but might be at the same end of the authoritarianism spectrum, the pro-authoritarianism spectrum. They might be the same in the pro-violence spectrum. Um, 
Okay, so 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 that's one one thing to know. A whole lot of further, very interesting questions about about how you measure distance in ideological space. Um, what exactly does one mean when one says that one ideology is further to the, for example, the left or the right of another ideology? Um, so uh, the key to that issue, I think, is is um, what I call the menu conception of ideological location. So the thought is this, for each dimension of ideological space, say the left to right dimension, an ideology's location along that dimension is determined by how it answers a menu of uh, diagnostic questions. So supposing you're trying to figure out um, uh, where to place an ideology um, uh, on the left to right dimension. So the only way you can really do that is to ask a, a, re ask a range of questions and then uh, use these questions diagnostically to place the ideology somewhere on the spectrum. So these will be classically questions about private property uh, the si and the size and role of the state. Um, no doubt a whole lot of other questions as well. So this is the menu conception of ideological space. Uh, now, uh, this conception of ideological space generates um, some forms of uh, relativity. So, so some, sometimes people will say that isn't it all relative? Well, here are three senses in which there is a kind of relativity to ideological uh, location. So, uh, of course, if there are different um, dimensions, the middle of one dimension might be at the far end of a different dimension. So that's one kind of uh, uh, relativity, a dimension relativity. Even if you're thinking about a given dimension, say the left or right dimension, um, there's also a further element of relativity, uh, what I call menu relativity. Um, and that arises because there's more than one menu of diagnostic questions that determine an ideology's location along a given dimension. So in interestingly, if you think about the left or right dimension, um, uh, classically, uh, an ideology's location along that dimension was determined by its uh, views about you know, private property and the role of the state. But if you think about the left to right dimension in the context of the United States today, uh, then in that context, there are a whole lot of issues that are as important, perhaps even more important in uh, ideological location. So there are it, the questions about, about race, sexuality, gun control, abortion, these all are, are, are significant questions um, in determining uh, um, the location of an ideology uh, on the left-right dimension uh, in the American context. So there's also then an element of menu relativity. And the last element of relativity, of, of most famously of all, is that what counts as an extremist position at one time, for example, uh, hostility to slavery, uh, pro votes for women might be completely mainstream at another. So uh, this is this is um, a reflection of the so-called Overton window moving uh, over over time. So the Overton window is is the range of positions that are mainstream at a given time. Uh, and and the point of this is that the the, the, the window can move. Uh, and indeed effective political part of the window. Okay, um, so just a quick word about the relationship between um, positional and methods extremism. Um, uh, uh, the two forms of extremism I've distinguished so far. So uh, one, one observation is that some, though not all, positionally extremist ideologies encourage the use of extreme methods. So in these cases, the use of extreme methods is explained at least in part by the user's ideology, <clears throat> um, but it can also happen that political actors whose ideologies are not extremist in positional terms still use or support the use of extreme methods to advance their political or ideological uh, interests. An interesting case um, here is the, um, uh, 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 the um, um, the Labour Party under Tony Blair, which uh, supported the use of uh, the, the, the use of violence in Iraq, um, um, 
but it's not clear that ideologically uh, the, uh, uh, Blair was an extremist. Um, so there is in principle a difference between um, <clears throat> um, one's uh, political ideology and one's attitude to violence. Okay, now I want to move on to the third type of extremism, which is psychological extremism. And I want to start with uh, a very famous discussion of fanaticism uh, in a book by Eric Hoffer, published in the 1950s, a book called, called uh, The True Believer. Um, so this is what Hoffer uh, is, that they seem to be at opposite poles, whether at one end. It is the fanatic and the moderate who are poles apart and never meet. The fanatics of various hues eye each other with suspicion and are ready to fly at each other's, each other's throat, but they are neighbours and almost of one family. Now, Hoffa is talking here about fanaticism. I think the same thing is true of um, uh, extremists. Uh, the sense in which they are all of one family, I want to say, is that they share a mindset, an extremist mindset. Um, so what do I mean by that? What is an extreme, what is the extremist mindset? So I said when I started out that a mindset is composed of various different components. And one component of a mindset, as I understand it, is one's preoccupation. Okay, so, so in, if you want to know someone's mindset, uh, one way to investigate that question is to ask the question, what are they? So I want to say that uh, one characteristic extremist preoccupation is what I call the purity preoccupation. Extremists are obsessed with, certainly preoccupied by, purity and the actual or threatened dilution of purity. Now, the purity that's at issue here might be religious purity, it might be ethnic or racial purity, or it might be ideological purity. Uh, so you can see examples of this purity preoccupation in, 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 many, in many cases. So uh, if you take ISIS, for example, uh, the ISIS project is uh, basically the project of purifying the Islamic lands of all alien and infidel influences. Um, of course, with the Nazis, you had, a, you, you had an obsession, a preoccupation uh, with racial purity. Uh, in the case of the Khmer Rouge in, in Cambodia, um, uh, there, there was a preoccupation with ideological purity, with, um, <clears throat> with practicing the purest form of Marxism, Leninism. Uh, pure and undiluted form of this. Uh, and, and my last example of uh, purity preoccupation uh, is a modern example, the RSS, which is a Hindu extremist organization in India. And um, uh, I'll just read you the RSS oath that you take to sign up to the RSS. Um, and, and the oath is, I take the oath that I will always protect the purity of the Hindu religion and the purity of Hindu culture for the supreme progress of the Hindu nation. So that's a kind of classic um, illustration of the purity preoccupation. So one thing that, you, that is very striking when you look at all these extremist organizations is, is that they have this purity preoccupation. Another extremist preoccupation is, is a preoccupation with victimhood. Extremists are preoccupied with their supposed victimization and humiliation by the other. Uh, and of particular importance uh, is, is, is what Martha Nussbaum um, uh, calls a, a sense of humiliated masculinity. So a very good example of that is, is the so-called incel movement, um, the involuntarily celibate men um, who have this weird idea that they are constantly being humiliated and victimized by women um, um, who refuse to sleep with them. Uh, so that's an example of this victimhood preoccupation. And the incel example, I think, is a, is a helpful one. Um, because, of course, in their case, 
uh, the victimhood that they are preoccupied with. Um, and, and, and so um, I want to say that talk of extremism is only appropriate when there is a preoccupation with imaginary persecution, or alternatively, when there is a grossly disproportionate response to actual persecution. Okay, so there are some examples of um, um, extremist preoccupations. I mean, there are a whole lot of others, uh, which I talk about in the book. Uh, but but these strike me as 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 uh, as, as in many ways um, the most uh, the most interesting. Okay, moving on to attitudes. So here are some um, uh, some attitudes that I think are part of the extremist mindset. Um, so when I talk about one's attitudes, I'm talking about one's stance or one's posture towards something. So pro violence in the case of militant extremism. So not all extremists are violent, uh, but pro being in favor of violence is certainly a characteristic attitude of militant extremism. Hostility to compromise is another characteristic attitude, indifferent to the negative consequences of their actions or policies. So extremists like to think that in order to make an omelet, you've got to break eggs, uh, even if the eggs happen to be the skulls of their own citizens. Um, then there is intolerance of the religious, ideological, or racial other. And lastly, there is anti pluralism, that is to say, rejection of the idea that there is no uniquely right way, legitimacy of imposing one's vision of the ideal form of life on others. So if you take ISIS, for example, I mean, of course, ISIS believe that there is a uniquely right way of living. Um, uh, 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 and, and, and their mission in the territories that they control is to impose that uniquely correct way of living uh, on the population. People do not have a choice. So, so that's a kind of classic part of the extremist mindset, anti-pluralism. Now, there's a lot to be said about all this, but I, I want to just focus on, on the second uh, one of my list, which is hostility to compromise. Now, one worry that you might have, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a legitimate worry, is to say, look, it's kind of weird to say that hostility to compromise has anything to do with extremism, because after all, isn't being principled also about hostility to compromise? Of a, um, co so you're hostile to compromises that compromise your principles. Um, so uh, what's the difference between being principled in, in a sense that is, is, is not just unproblematic, but indeed even admirable? Uh, what's the difference between that and the hostility to compromise that I am uh, incorporating in the extremist mindset? Well, the answer is that there are compromises and there are compromises. Um, and this is a point that is made in a brilliant book by Abishai Margalit called On Compromise and Rotten Compromises. Um, so Margalit has a very rich and interesting discussion of this uh, issue that's almost completely neglected in philosophy, but he's obviously humanly very important. So Margalit basically says that, that, look, political compromises, especially compromises for the sake of peace, are a good thing. They should be applauded. However, there are some compromises that he calls rotten compromises, and rotten compromises are to be avoided at all costs. Um, a rotten compromise, as he understands it, is an agreement to establish uh, or maintain uh, an inhuman regime. Um, so, uh, it, so, so on this view, um, the ANC uh, uh, didn't compromise with the apartheid regime, uh, although it was offered various compromises over the years, and it was it was right not to compromise because the compromises it were it was being offered were rotten compromises. They were compromises that constituted an agreement to us to, to to maintain an inhuman regime, namely apartheid. So what I want to say is this, that being principled does not require hostility to compromise. What it requires is a rejection of rotten compromises. And this is um, where you really see the difference between um, uh, uh, extremism and people of principle. Extremism 
I want to say is the disposition to view any compromise as a rotten compromise, as a capitulation, a betrayal. So I think that's part of the extremist mindset, right? the tendency to see every compromise as a rotten compromise. And of course, this aversion to compromise is very much connected to the purity preoccupation. It's connected because extremists regard compromise as an act of pollution, as detracting from the purity that they seek. Um, so here's a great quotation from Margulit. Now, Margulit doesn't talk about extremists. He talks about sectarians, but the point applies to extremists too. So Margulit says, in general, the sectarian is in favor of purging and splitting for the sake of retaining the integrity of what should be kept pure. So this is the Monty Python sketch about, you know, um, um, various uh, movements um, with weird uh, uh, titles all claiming to be distinct from everyone else. So Margaret continues, shit is the negation of the pure. The sectarian craves life without shit. Compromise is part and parcel of the shitty world. Well, that just seems to be true. Right? Those are just things that are true. Um, and I think that what Margulit says here about, about sectarians applies um, also to um, uh, extremists. Okay, so, uh, so, so far I've talked about um, extremist preoccupations, extremist attitudes. Um, there's also something to be said about um, the emotions, but for lack of time, I'm going to skip over that. I want to move on to the, the fourth element of the extremist mindset, which is what I call extremist thinking. So I, I, I want to suggest that there are certain um, patterns or styles of thinking that are very characteristic of extremism or extremists. Um, so first of all, a lot of extremist organizations engage in um, apocalyptic thinking. That is thinking that is shaped by a preoccupation with the end of the world, or at least the end of the thinker's world. So two examples of this, of course, is ISIS, um, which is absolutely obsessed with uh, <clears throat> um, the end of the world, uh, and 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 is 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 uh, its thinking is shaped by this uh, is by this by this preoccupation, uh, and then you have uh, white supremacists who worry about the so-called great replacement, which is the supposed replacement of the white population of Europe and North America by, uh, by, by immigrants and in particular by um, Muslims. Um, so that's one, uh, another example of this uh, type of thinking. Um, another element of extremist thinking is utopian thinking. That is to say, thinking that manifests a utopian faith in creative destruction. Uh, so there's a very good characterization of this uh, in a book by John Gray called Al-Qaeda and what it means to be modern. Um, so he talks about utopian thinking as animated by the belief that a type, of, a, a type of society better than any that has ever existed can be brought into being by the systematic use of violence. Um, and, and, and Gray's discussion of this is very interesting because he thinks this is something that Al-Qaeda has in common with the American neocons, um, who also, in his view, um, had a utopian faith in creative destruction. And that's what led them um, uh, to destroy Iraq, right? So that's a kind of classic um, <clears throat> uh, a pattern of thinking that I see as part of an extremist uh, mindset. And then, of course, the last thing is uh, um, conspiracy thinking, which, again, is very much part of the extremist mindset. So not all conspiracy theorists are extremists, but I think uh, pretty much all extremists are conspiracy theorists. So um, uh, um, certainly um, you find uh, conspiracy thinking on the far left, you find it on the far right, um, and Islamist groups uh, also are very much um, uh, engaged in conspiracy thinking. Usually, and of course, this, this sort of thinking, conspiracy thinking, is very often is very anti-Semitic. Um, and that, again, is not a necessary element of extremism, but is a strikingly common um, um, element of what I'm calling extremist thinking. Um, now, given what I've said about the extremist mindset, I just want to make a couple of obvious um, observations about this. I mean, the first obvious observation is that, is that the extremist mindset, um, as I have understood it, 
is a matter of degree. A person's mindset it can be more or less extremist. They can be more or less preoccupied um, with purity, for example. They can be more or less preoccupied with victimhood and humiliation. They can have some of these preoccupations and not others. So it's not an all or nothing matter. So you know, perhaps everybody listening to this um, lecture is somewhere on the extremist scale for all I know. Um, uh, the, 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 the second thing to say is that, is that although I've given you a whole list of, um, of, of features of extremist mindset, I'm not suggesting that extremists have to display all of the features um, of the extremist mindset. Um, I, I mean, an interesting question is whether there are any features that are essential. Um, is, there a, is there a kind of core which all extremists must, um, must, 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 must have if they are to count as having the extremist mindset? And I'm just going to leave that question open here. Okay, so now let's just go back to my um, initial question. Right? The initial question was, um, is extremism something real? Are we, is, is, this, is this label a useful label? Um, so I, I want to say on the basis of, 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 of the, the, the various um, um, classifications that I've suggested, that actually it is a useful label. Um, so for example, if you think about ideologies, um, of course, I mean, in a, in a way, ideological space is only notional, right? It's literally such a thing as ideological space. But the idea that um, you, can, you can think of ideologies as having locations relative to one another uh, seems to me to be a useful analytical tool for understanding and classifying ideologies. And these really are extremist ideologies, right? Um, I mean, you can be skeptical about the misuse of the label extremist in some cases, but it would be, uh, at least in my view, somewhat weird to say that um, there isn't really a, any, any legitimate sense in which uh, Nazism was an extremist ideology. Uh, equally, it seems to me that the use of extreme methods by ideologically opposed political actors is a real phenomenon uh, and that the concept of methods extremism captures this. Um, so let me give you an example. So here are two people I talk about a bit in my book. So one person is Anders uh, Breivik. So this is the guy uh, who uh, killed uh, over 60 people uh, in Norway a few years ago, uh, a right-wing uh, extremist uh, who used extreme violence to advance his political cause. Uh, on the other hand, you have uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, KSM, the architect of the 9-11 attacks. Um, now, of course, the ideology of KSM and the ideology of Breivik are, are, are completely opposed to one another. I mean, from Breivik's point of view, KSM is the enemy and vice versa. Um, but of course, they do have something very striking in common, which is their willingness to resort to extreme violence in pursuit of their political objectives. Um, and that I think is something that they have in common. This isn't just a figment of my imagination. If you don't think about it in this way, it's very hard to capture what seems to be true about these two characters. Well, similarly, if you think, if you compare ISIS with the Khmer Rouge, very different ideologically speaking, but um, uh, their, their methods are strikingly similar. Both engaged in essentially genocidal violence, psychological features that extremists with very different ideological agendas have in common. Now, of course, as philosophers, we're trained to be suspicious when claims about what is really the case are made. <clears throat> I mean, we ask questions about, you know, really in what sense. Uh, but although I think these are good questions, which I go into a bit more in, in, in the book, I don't think there's any way to get around using, um, using these uh, labels. If the concept of extremism didn't exist, it wouldn't, it, it seems to me, it would have to be uh, invented. Um, the concept is misused sometimes, but it doesn't follow that it doesn't have a proper use. Okay, so um, um, so I've, 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 going back to my very, um, to the start of this lecture, I said I was going to answer three questions, uh, and I think I've answered the first two questions, maybe what is extremism and how useful is the concept? 
Um, I now want to uh, tackle in conclusion my third question, which is whether extremism is necessarily a bad thing. <clears throat> okay, so, 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 I mean, one thing that, that, that people say, which I think is, is um, perfectly right, um, is that we owe a number of our freedoms today to the actions of people who would have been regarded as extremists in their day. Um, so if you think about the suffragettes, um, well, they were regarded as extremists in their day. If you think about campaigners against slavery, they were regarded as extremists in their day. Um, uh, so if somebody wants to make a case for extremism or indeed for fanaticism, they might point to examples like that. Now, I want to focus particularly on the case of the anti-slavery campaigners in 19th century uh, America. Uh, now, one thing that's striking about, about these campaigners is that they, um, well, they tended not to call themselves extremists, but some of them at any rate call themselves fanatics. Um, and, and some people today um, use this to argue that we need to be very careful in condemning fanaticism and, and indeed condemning extremism, because these are cases in which you have good extremism, good fanaticism. Um, <clears throat> OK, so what should we make of that? Um, so what I want to say about this is the following. Although it's true that the abolitionists, people like William Lloyd Garrison, may have described themselves as fanatics, um, I think that they weren't actually fanatics. Although it's true that they might have been regarded as extremists, they weren't in fact extremists in all the three senses that I have uh, distinguished, although they might be extremists in one of them. So the first thing to say is that they weren't extremists in the sense that they didn't employ extreme methods in pursuit of their objectives. Um, uh, the, the campaign of the um, abolitionists was basically a political campaign. It was, with one or two exceptions, a nonviolent campaign. I think it's very hard to argue that they employed extreme methods in pursuit of their objectives. Uh, so they weren't methods extremists. Seems to me also that the abolitionists lacked many of the characteristic preoccupations and attitudes of the extremist. Um, they weren't preoccupied with purity. The victimhood that they were preoccupied with was genuine victimhood. The slaves actually were victims. They certainly were opposed to compromise with the slaveholders. Uh, but of course, those compromises that they were opposed to were rotten compromises. So uh, it's very hard to see much evidence of an extremist mindset uh, in the uh, among among the abolitionists. I mean, if you want to make the case that they were uh, that they were extremists, um, you might want to say that well, their position in ideological space was at one end of uh, an ideological spectrum at that at that time, and that is true. And I, that is that is the truth in the claim that they were extremists. Although, of course. Um, relative to our standards today, they certainly uh, were not um, extremists. Um, okay, so, so I don't think that the case of the abolitionists uh, really supports the idea that um, um, extremism um, is really uh, a route to salvation or a route to liberation. So instead of talking about extremism, I, 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 I'd want to suggest that we should think more in terms of uh, radicalism. And so here are some things of, um, of radicalism. Now, radicalism, I want to say, is, is a helpful notion. So if you're thinking about the abolitionists, um, the suffragette dealing with here is radicalism, not extremism. Um, so radicalism, as I understand it, is opposed to gradualism. So the thought is that if you're a, ra if you're a radical, um, there are certain things that you want now. So the, so, the, so, the, so the radical abolitionists were opposed to a gradual um, abolition of slavery. They wanted the immediate emancipation of the slaves. Radicalism is opposed to rotten compromises, not to compromises as such. 
Radicalism endorses the use of extra institutional means in pursuit of its objectives, but extra institutional means don't have to be violent. There are many extra institutional means that are open to, ra to, to, um, uh, to, to radicals that don't constitute extreme methods. Uh, radicalism, as I understand it, is not opposed to violence per se, but only endorses violence in very limited circumstances. And lastly, radicalism challenges mainstream thinkings and questions assumptions that are usually unquestioned. So um, the arguments that are presented in favour of extremism and fanaticism, I want to say, are not, in fact, arguments for fanaticism and extremism. They're really arguments for radicalism. Um, and this is really, my, uh, this is really the, the, the um, uh, conclusion that I want to draw. Uh, history teaches us that radicalism has indeed been the key to human progress and human freedom. I think that is beautiful. But conformity is indeed a danger to our intellectual life and to some, if you understand extremism in the ways that I have tried to understand it. Uh, and, and of course, conservative critics of radicalism confuse it. They like to confuse it with extremism. They like to classify uh, radicals as extremists. But radicals shouldn't encourage this confusion by describing themselves as extremists. Um, I think that's just a mistake. Okay, so, so, so uh, um, to, 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 to sum up, um, what I've tried to do in this lecture is to uh, distinguish three conceptions of extremism, uh, uh, give you at least a, a, an idea of the uh, complexity of these different conceptions of extremism. Um, I've tried to argue that the concept of extremism is a useful analytical tool uh, and that there is such a thing as extremism in, in various different senses. We're not just dealing with a complete, um, a complete fiction or fantasy. And the last thing I've tried to convince you of is that, is that extremism is in fact not a good thing, um, but there's something else uh, that, with which extremism is confused that is a good thing, and that something else is radicalism. So let's not be extremists, let's be radicals. That's it.